Hi, my name is Patrick, and uh, this is the story of how Christ has transformed my life. I grew up in the church. Uh, my dad uh, was, a, was a Southern Baptist preacher, and I, I grew up going to church every Sunday, um, three times a week. Uh, we you know, went on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights too, and I uh, became quickly very good at living up to the expectations that other people and my parents placed on me as, um, as a churchgoer. And I say churchgoer because I realize now that my faith as a child wasn't um, what God had intended it to be. Um, I made a profession of faith when I was very young. I was about eight and uh, was baptized just because it was kind of what, what I felt like I needed to do. Um, but I didn't really have a real relationship with Jesus. Um, life went on. I went through school and uh, got an education and uh, began a career, got married, uh, had kids, and all the while I continued to live uh, for, for me. I continued to live and do whatever I wanted to do, not uh, whatever God wanted me to do. Um, my wife thought that she married a good Christian man, but in reality, uh, she married a wicked sinner. Both she and my kids paid the price of my selfishness and, and my sinful ways. I don't know exactly why I ended up in Lake Havasu City all the way from Arkansas, but uh, all I know is that God brought me here for a very specific reason. I think he had to get me away from my comfort zone and really pull me out of the situation that I was in in order to really get me to where I didn't have any distractions between me and him. And um, I began to go to Calvary because my wife expected me to go with her to church on Sunday and um, so I, I did to, to, to keep the peace and um, like a, a, a good church going Christian is supposed to do, I, I began to serve here at Calvary and I, and I, I started to, uh, to play uh, guitar on, on the weekends with the worship team and uh, began uh, being mentored by our worship pastor, Jesse. He was one of the only people that saw through the mask that I was wearing and really knew that something wasn't quite right. Um, I had uh, been living in sin. I had not lived up to my marriage vows. I was, um, I, I was not faithful to my wife. I uh, was abusing substances to mask the emotional pain that I was carrying, and um, I was really good at hiding it. I really did a good job of, of putting, on, putting on airs to everyone around that everything was okay, but in reality it wasn't. You see, for the past few months before that, I was suicidal. I was in a deep state of depression and um, was kind of at the end of my rope and actually had a plan to take my own life. Um, and and for, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit allowed Jesse to see that and he started to encourage me to go to celebrate recovery. And uh, I relented after him uh, pestering me about it for a while and um, I went for about three weeks. And um, the third time I went, I encountered um, God in a very real way and became acutely aware that I did not belong to Him and my life was a wreck. God showed me a way out um, and He brought me to my rock bottom in order to allow me to come to the end of myself. And He just reached down and pulled me out of that hole and made me His. And the the process of healing and recovery began. That night after Celebrate Recovery, I gave my life to Christ and told Him that I was gonna surrender every fiber of my being to Him and I was gonna live the rest of my life for Him and I've done that since, the, since that night. He's restored my marriage. He has preserved my family, which is way more than I deserve. And He has totally made me a new creation. I want to do two things. I want to encourage those of you that are children of God to keep fighting the good fight. And for those of you that, that might be living the way that I was, wearing a mask, putting on a show, um, living out a faith that may seem genuine from the outside, but on the inside isn't really genuine at all, you know it, and more importantly, God knows it. And if that's you, 
Don't waste any more time. It's worth it. Whatever pain you have to go through, whatever struggles you have to deal with, to get right with God and to fully surrender yourself to Him, um, you'll never be the same. Um, thank you. Well, welcome to Calvary and welcome to seven weeks of transformation. Uh, I am so excited to be able to kick off this series as we talk about God's transforming power in our lives. Now, if you want to get the most out of these next seven weeks, you are going to have to get up right now, run to the Connection Center and pick up one of these uh, transformed journals. Now I've heard them called a workbook. They're not a workbook. These are journals. There are seven uh, daily devotionals for each day of the week as you walk through the Transform series. There's a place for sermon notes and then there's a place also for your life group notes. Please feel free at any point during the message, jump up and go get one. You're, you are gonna have the best seven weeks of your life if you get one of these books and use them during the sermon and use them for your life groups and use them for your daily devotional. It will bless you. I, half, I halfway wish we had people like hot dog vendors going up and down the aisles, you know, like, hey, what's up? Hey, you know, and just toss it to you. I also wish they had hot dogs, you know. Uh, so, oh man, in the South, they used to have a Home Depot. You'd leave Home Depot and there'd be a guy selling hot dogs. It was amazing. Anyway, so seriously, you won't hurt my feelings at all. If you want to jump up and go grab a copy, it will be a blessing to you. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, you can turn to Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And if you don't have a Bible, feel free to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 1039. As always, if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take one of those Bibles home with you, read it and apply it to your life because at Calvary, we believe if we read God's word and apply God's word, he will transform our lives. Now, the theme verse for our Transform series is found in Romans 12, 2. Now, I want to show you this verse on the screen. If you're watching online, it's going to pop up right beside me. I think it's right there. Uh, and whether you're in the worship center, or whether you're online, we're all going to take a look at Romans 12, 2 together. Romans 12, 2 says this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, according to this verse, if you and I want to experience change in our lives. If you and I want to be transformed, uh, if we want to change a habit or behavior in my life or your life that we don't like, we start by letting God change the way we think. See, if you want to live a transformed life, the key to transformation doesn't begin with our actions. It doesn't begin with our feelings. It doesn't begin in our body. That's conformity. Uh, that's conformity that leads to legalism. If we're just going to change the outward behavior, but we don't mean it within our hearts, then we've just become a Pharisee. We're just practicing legalism. But if we really want to experience transformation, it begins in our thought life. If we change the way we think, it will change the way we feel. If we change the way we feel, it's going to change our actions Transformation begins with your willingness to allow God to change the way you think. Back at Romans 12, 2, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And during this Transform series, we're going to apply this Romans 12, 2 principle to seven areas of our lives. Today, we're going to be talking about the transformation spiritually, how we can be drawn nearer to God spiritually through the transform process. We'll, we'll talk about uh, physical, mental, emotional transformation, relational transformation, financial transformation, and vocational transformation. Let me ask you a question. 
Are you willing to let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think? Good, because if you're not, this series is not for you. If you just jumped up to grab a book, go get your money back. We've got to be willing to allow God to change the way we think. So I want to invite you quietly just to say a prayer to God and invite him to do just that. I want you to invite God to change the way you think over the next seven weeks. And if God changes the way you think over the next seven weeks, then God's going to change your character for the rest of your lifetime. So take a minute and just quietly say, God, I invite you to change the way I think. Today, we kick off a sermon series talking about spiritual transformation. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture that for the most part, most people would say, well, this is a way, uh, this is a gospel presentation. This is a, a way for somebody to come to Christ. But also that same roadmap that we're going to look at also applies for those of us who have been in Christ for a long time. If you've been a follower of Jesus, yet you feel distant from God, the principles of this passage can change your life if you apply them. Now, I want you to think about um, your life at, and compared to your relationship with God as though it was a boat by a dock for just a minute. Okay, a boat by a dock. What happens if you don't tie a boat off at a dock? It drifts away. I don't know where you are at in your relationship with God. If you've already been a follower of Jesus for quite some time, I don't know where you're at. But I do know that if I am not intentional about tying my life off to Jesus on a regular basis, I drift away. I hit periods of time where I don't sense God's presence in my life. I hit periods of time and seasons where I don't sense God listening to my prayers. And I, I come to realize God never moved. It's me. I'm the one that drifted away. So maybe you've surrendered your life to Jesus, but maybe you have not spoken to him in years. Or maybe you've just been distant from God for the last month. Or maybe just the last few days as you think about everything that we've experienced with the political cycle in 2020 and COVID. Maybe with everything that's happening, you're saying, I just don't sense God's presence in my life. So wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, this passage of scripture is gonna help you draw nearer to God. It's in Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 15. We're gonna look at the story of the prodigal son and the prodigal son's dad and see how this applies to our lives. Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. So he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. 
This is a beautiful story of the kindness of the Father, and it shows us today how to grow closer to God. Whether you've yet to become a follower of Jesus or you've drifted away, if we want to draw near to God first, we must each decide to get fed up with my life and own up to my sin. We must decide first to get fed up with my life and own up to my sin. The reason why the son returned to the father is he had grown disgusted with his life and he had grown fed up with the decisions that he had made. He left his home. He wasted all of his money on wild drinking and on women and on the party lifestyle. He winds up broke, homeless, and slopping pigs on a farm. And he's, he's doing this and the pods, the, 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 the slop looks so good. His stomach is growling as he surveys the rotted cabbage and rotted vegetables that the pigs are eating. And he says, man, that sure looks good. I wish I had some of that, but he didn't get anything. And so he takes a look, a good hard look at his life. And he gets fed up with the decisions that he made. Please understand this principle. God is not going to transform your life over the next seven weeks if you think there's nothing about your life that needs to change. If you say, I'm fine, I'm fine in the area spiritually, I'm fine with my relationships, I'm fine vocationally, this series isn't going to do you any good. But... If you can reach the point in each one of those areas where you say, I'm fed up with this, then God is going to begin to transform your life. Nothing's going to change in your life until you say something like, I'm tired of being stressed out all the time. I'm tired of being frustrated all the time. I'm tired of feeling overworked all the time. I'm tired of feeling distant from God. Nothing will change in your life until you get fed up. You got to get disgusted with the decisions that you've made. You got to get discontent with where you're at. And when you get fed up, then you own up to your sin. You get fed up and you own up. When he came to himself, the Bible tells us in verse 17, he said, I have sinned. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't blame the farmers. He didn't blame the people that he partied with. He said, I'm the one that has done this. I'm the one that has rejected my father. I'm the one that has squandered my inheritance. I am the cause of this problem. I have sinned. Now, raise your hand if you have ever in your relationship with God, even if you're a follower of Christ already, if you've prayed and felt like your prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. Raise your hand if you've ever prayed and felt like you were just talking to yourself. Raise your hand if sometimes you wonder if God is actually listening to you. Raise your hand if you sometimes wonder if your spouse actually listens to you. Many of us have. Some of you guys are going to get in an argument on the way home. And by the way, you don't have to raise your hand when I say that about the spouse, but I always try to have a little bit of something funny to say. If you are a follower of Jesus, meaning if you've come to a moment in your life where you recognize that you're a sinner and Jesus paid the price for sin, that he died, that he rose from the dead, and if you surrendered your life over to God and you received Jesus as your savior, then you understand fully that the penalty for your sins has fully been paid. The wrath of God for sin, your sin and my sin, was poured out on Jesus on the cross. There no longer remains a penalty for our sin, but we would all be honest and say sin still has consequences. See, when we choose to sin, we're the ones that drift away in our relationship with God. If you're already a born again follower of Jesus, you can drift away from your nearness to God. And remember, the reason why Jesus paid the penalty for our sins was so that we could have a relationship with God. Because sin is what prevented us from having that relationship. And so 
sin actually still causes us to grow distant from God. It's us rebelling from God. We're still forgiven. We're still part of his family. We're just not talking to him like we should. We're not spending time with him like we ought to. You don't leave the family. You just stop talking to your dad when you choose to sin and you stay stuck in that. So raise your hand if you're a follower of Jesus, but you've experienced sometimes that drifting away in your relationship with God. See, me too. I've been there. And when I come to my senses and I look up and I realize that I was created to know God personally and my sin, because I chose to sin, uh, I've drifted away from him. I get fed up and I own up. And then once again, I sacrifice my whole life and determine to live transformed. Being frustrated and being fed up is not enough. Owning up is not enough. Then I've got to do something about it. I've got to once again sacrifice my whole life and determine to live a transformed life. Now, did you notice that the son experienced a transformation in his attitude? When he first went to his father, it was all about me, 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 my, 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 my. That's what it was about. He had a very self-centered attitude. In fact, when he went to his father and said, give me my inheritance, it was as though he was saying to his dad, dad, I wish you were dead so I could have the inheritance that you've worked for all your life to give to me. That's what he was saying. Dad, I, I wish you were no longer here because I'm looking at the Cadillac and I want it or the Camelback or whatever it was. I, I'm looking at the farms and the lands and I'm looking at the money that you've inherited, uh, that you've built up and I know you're going to leave it to me and I want it now. We can identify with that. If you have a microwave oven, you know what instant gratification is like. I mean... We want it now. We don't want the crock pot. We want the microwave. We want everything in life immediately when we decide that we want it. That's why there's so much debt in America. In verse 19, however, the son says, make me a servant. His attitude changed. No longer was it about me, 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 my, my, my. Now it was about I've blown it. In fact, I don't deserve to be part of his family. Just put, make me a slave inside the house. Make me a servant. See, when you and I sacrifice our whole life, we are like the son saying to the father, make me a servant. It's a life that continues to deny our self-centeredness, our selfishness. It's a life that moves from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. When Paul challenged the believers in Romans 12, 1, he challenged them to become a living sacrifice. Now think about those two words juxtaposed together. I get to say juxtaposed because I now wear glasses. Think about those two words side by side. A living sacrifice. Every sacrifice was a dead animal. It was dead grain. It was dead food. It was a dead dove. It was a dead cow. And Paul said, be a living sacrifice. A lifestyle that denies our selfish tendencies and takes up our cross and follows after Jesus daily. And when your heart moves from a self-centeredness to a God-centeredness, transformation begins. And I've got good news and bad for you about that transformation process. Transformation is not instant. It is a process. That's the bad news. It does not happen overnight. And the good news is this. If you are already a follower of Jesus, God is committed to working in you right now. In fact... He is working in your life. He's tinkering with your heart right now. Philippians 1.6 says this, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. 
I want to encourage you to memorize two verses today. Memorize Romans 12, 2 and memorize Philippians 1, 6. When you feel down and you feel like a failure and you feel discouraged and you feel overwhelmed, we have a promise that God is committed to working on your character. He is not finished with you. You are in a transformation process if you're already a follower of Jesus. That's why you still blow it. That's why you still mess up because God is not done working in your character. He's not done transforming you yet. He who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion. I love that. Because when I feel fearful or I feel stuck or I feel trapped and I get overwhelmed about all the circumstances that I experience in my life, I can remember this verse and I remember this promise that God is not done with me yet, that he's committed to working on me and you right now, tomorrow, and forever. And look what happens the moment that we say, God, I'm fed up with the way I've been living and I'm ready to grow as a servant. Look what he does as we look at this illustration of the father and the son. He will meet you more than halfway. He will meet you right where you are. Like the father to the son, he will throw his arms around you. He'll come running to meet you, throw his arms around you. He will kiss you and he, he will say to you, I know you blew it. But then he treats you like you never blew it. There were a couple of the, the things that the father gave to the son, but I want to point out the signet ring. The father requested that the son be given that ring to wear. And in those days, a signet ring was essentially a credit card. You take the ring, you press it in the wax, and that was like the credit card. The father said to his servants, Go get my unlimited American Express card and give it to my son who just blew half my inheritance. When you return to God, God treats you as though you never messed up. That is grace. That is love. That is mercy that is undeserved. God does not hold a grudge against you and I for all the dumb and stupid stuff that we've done. He is ready to lavishly right now pour out his grace and his kindness and his mercy on you if you're willing to take that step and draw near to him. God has got a better life for you than you could ever possibly imagine. So return to him. So this process that we see in this passage, I get fed up, I own up, I humble myself, I take the attitude of a servant, I determine to live a life transformed, and finally, there's one more thing that I've got to do when I realize I've drifted away from God, and that's this. Celebrate with thanks and with praise celebrate with thanks and praise. Now, I know that there's some ways that we celebrate in our lives. We like to celebrate. We like to open up confetti canyons, uh, cannons. We like to tell other people good news about what, what's happened in our lives. We celebrate that way. But you can just simply say, thank you, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. And I love how the father says to the servants and says to the son, hey, today... We're going to kill that fattened calf and we're going to celebrate because my boy has come back to life. My son has returned. Life becomes a party when we live out a transformed life. Everything is better when we're living in God's grace and mercy. Everything seems better, even the hard times and difficult situations that we face. So here's one way that you can celebrate. Psalm 68, 4 says this. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him. His name is the Lord. Just want to challenge you with this. Now, I know we got some men in the room and oh, I don't want to sing. The Bible does not teach us to, that we have to be pretty in our singing. Okay. 
I think sometimes one of the worst things, not, 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 I'm not saying I don't like a choir, but when we get all the talented people and we put them on the platform and they sing, those of us who can't sing are like, man, they sing really good. And we're looking at all their talent. And yet the Bible teaches us to make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's what happened when I sing. I love at the close of the service, sometimes I'll go to the back, or, you know, if I can make my way out, and I'll, I'll go to the back and I'll sing. And I'm like Elf. I sing loud for all to hear, you know, Buddy the Elf. And so I'm singing loudly, and the people in front of me do this. I always see it. I had one woman turn to me one time and say, you should really go be in the choir. And I knew what she meant by that. You shouldn't be sitting behind me when you sing. <sighs> see, I like to make a joyful noise. Sometimes I sing off key. No, most of the time I sing off key. Most of the time I'm not even on pitch or tune. And sometimes I don't even know the words that I'm supposed to be singing. It's okay to screw up and mess up. It's okay to sing the wrong words because I'm not singing to celebrate anybody around me. I'm, sing I'm singing to celebrate forgiveness. I'm singing to celebrate transformation. I'm singing to celebrate hope that Christ has given me a second chance and a third chance. So I want to ask you for your own transformation Consider singing in church. It is great therapy to sing with other people. Uh, it's good for your mental health. It's good for your emotional health. It's good for your social health. It's good for your physical health. And all those different areas that we're going to be looking at, singing is good for you. There was an extensive scientific study done, and they discovered what happens to our bodies when we sing with other people. That when we sing with other people, it actually lowers our blood pressure. Raise your hand if you know somebody that needs their blood pressure lowered. It releases endorphins in our minds that make us feel better. When we sing with other people, it improves our mood. It builds confidence. It relieves lonely feelings that we have. It releases negative energy. It releases stress. And it actually creates positive emotions. Have you ever been to a concert and the person, the artist is up there and everybody starts singing along with them? It's like an incredible moment because everybody's on the same page and everybody knows the words and everyone's singing and they're not frowning. They're actually happy. Why? Because their body's transforming. Now, can you imagine what happens to a believer when they're singing together with other believers and worship to God. That's why our worship is joyful. That's why our worship is mountain shaking sometimes. It's amazing that as we celebrate God's love and we worship him as, as, as our creator, that he actually blesses us that he relieves our stress when we're worshiping him with other people, that he releases endorphins in our mind so we actually feel better as we worship him in obedience, that he releases our stress as we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, as we place all of our lives back at his throne and worship him, we actually feel better. Isn't it neat that that's the way God designed us? And isn't it, Need that God asks us to worship him. And as we worship him, he blesses us as a result. Now, if you find yourself at the pit of despair, like the prodigal son, or maybe where Patrick Bowen has been, if you find that your life, you're just playing the game, you're not really a follower of Jesus, you're just kind of playing the game and pretending, our prayer team will be here at the front at the close of the service, and they would love to lead you to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that the gospel transforms our lives, that you give us hope, that you've created us to worship you, and that as we worship you, you actually bless us, and you transform us, and you change us. 
So Lord, it's our prayer that we would all become the men and women that you've created us to be. Help us to become the worshipers that you've created us to be. Help us to be a blessing to our family and to our friends. And Lord, if we're distant from you in our relationship, God, help us to take that first step and let you transform us into a new person by changing the way we think. God, bless our thought life over the next seven weeks. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.